Pastor Oliver, to my Elizabeth Baptist Church family, you may be seated. Good afternoon. Let me start by expressing my sincere gratitude on behalf of Carolyn and our children for how grateful we are for the love and support that has been shown to us by our Elizabeth Baptist Church family over the last several weeks. And just how blessed and grateful I feel to have had Pastor Oliver by my side from the very day of my suspension all the way up through into today. He's been right there with me and all of you, my brothers and sisters of the Elizabeth Baptist Church have poured out your love and support in immeasurable ways. And we are very, very grateful. Would you bow with me for a moment of prayer? Dear God, our Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you for such a wonderful day that you have blessed us to be alive to see it one more time and to be back here at church to worship you and to praise your holy name. We thank you, dear God, that you have blessed us to be Americans, to be in the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're so grateful for the principles and values that you gave what we refer to as our founding fathers to establish this nation, one nation under God. We glorify your name. Now, Father, I humbly submit myself to you that you would use my body and use my lips and my tongue, these vocal cords to complete the assignment that our pastor has given me to do today. I'm so honored to share with them what you have been to me in my life. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight and be an encouragement to these my brothers and sisters. And I'll be careful to give you all the praise in Christ's name, amen. Well, brothers and sisters, in the spirit of the series of awesome messages that have transformed all of us and set us on a path for a an unprecedented 2015 under the theme of reset. Uh, even though this is a testimony, I felt it would be appropriate to capture it under a theme aligned with the reset theme that we are beginning the year off with. And so I want to give the theme of this testimony, reset, real life application in real time. Reset, real life application in real time. And there's an underlying theme, the blessing of sufferings, the blessing of sufferings. My life in public service has been on public display over the last two months from the week prior to Thanksgiving through the Christmas holiday season and even to begin the new year at the announcement of my 30-day suspension without pay and subsequent return to work on January the 6th, 2015, only to find out that I would be terminated from the city of Atlanta as fire chief. A city that I love with all of my heart under the leadership of the Honorable Mayor Kasim Reed, whom I love and have tremendous respect. As I have reflected back over my life during the past few weeks, I've come to realize that God has been preparing me for this storm my entire life. And I'm grateful to share with you a portion of that story this morning. I've come to realize, brothers and sisters, that the Christian walk of faith is comprised of a series of startups, and resets, and that suffering is an inherent but extremely necessary component of filling, fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. While I was serving as fire chief in Shreveport, Louisiana a number of years ago, 
I was going through a series of sufferings. Sometimes sufferings come sequentially, one after another. Sometimes sufferings come simultaneously, two or more at the same time. And I was going through that experience and I was asking God for answers. And God directed me to do a word study on the word suffering in scripture. And I found out during that word study that the words in scripture, afflictions, trials, tribulations, tests, persecutions, and chastisements all fall under the category of sufferings. And that whenever the child of God is experiencing afflictions, trials, tribulations, tests, persecutions, and chastisements, it's always, always, always working together for our good. And that God is always planning to set us up for blessings following sufferings. All of our lives as believers, we experience one form of suffering or another. Most of my sufferings in my life <coughs> have been self-inflicted sufferings. What I'm talking about, brothers and sisters, is there are times in my life that I knew I was not doing what God would have me to do or what God had told me to do. And God brought afflictions, trials, tribulations, tests, persecutions, and chastisement upon me in my life to get me back in alignment with the plan that he had for my life and my future. By his love and by his grace, God allows suffering. And as we're going through those developmental years in our faith, most of our faith, not just Kelvin Cochran, are self-inflicted. But because of my suffering, sufferings are used in many ways to strip away bad relationships and bad ways and bad habits from us as we go through sufferings. And because there has been a stripping away and a pruning in my life because of sufferings, I can stand before you today and say that there are some things that I used to do that I don't do no more. Many of us can share that testimony because of sufferings. But even today, as I have grown in the Lord, I must admit that there are some things that I used to do that I don't do as often as I used to do them. So I'm still a work in progress. So please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. I can remember times during my wilderness years of rebellion and willful disobedience, willful transgressions that God would say to me, now that's the last time I'm going to let you get away with that. Anybody ever hear that from God before? Now that's the last time you, I'm going to let you get away with that. Now like me, many times I obeyed and didn't do that again. But sometimes I did it again even after he told me. That's the last time I'm going to let you get away with that. And because he's so faithful and because grace always abounds much more than sin, even when I did it again after he told me not to, he lovingly chastised me so that eventually I could be stripped away of those ways and habits that would keep me from fulfilling my destiny. This time, though, this suffering is different. This suffering is not a self-inflicted suffering. God has assured me that this is a God-inflicted suffering. And God has reminded me of several of the people we celebrate in his word that he has allowed to go through God-inflicted suffering. Remember Job? Job was just minding his business, taking care of his wife, taking care of him and providing for his children. All his children had houses. He was taking care of his flocks and his fields. He was a, a cattleman and had agriculture. He was just minding his own business, taking care of family and worshiping God. And God volunteered him for a test. Tremendous sufferings where he lost everything. But the good news is he was restored twice as much as he lost after the suffering. Remember the story of Esther? She was just a beautiful Jewish girl being a faithful maiden in her clan and in her tribe. And the king decided he needed another wife and he wanted the most beautiful, fine woman in the land. 
sent out scouts so they found Esther and Esther became the wife of a pagan king and even in the light of a bad marriage she ended up being the, sa the savior of her people because their enemies were setting them up to kill all the Jews and she ended up saving all of them from genocide remember Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego they were just courageously and faithfully serving the kingdom of Babylon even though they were not of that faith order and the king decided he wanted everybody to bow down to a pagan god and that was just one law of the land that they were not willing to obey and they found themselves in a fiery furnace and there was another person in there with them that delivered them from that fiery furnace and ultimately they became promoted to governors over territories in the land of Babylon and then their homeboy Daniel was serving as one of the presidents over three provinces of Babylon and his co-workers didn't like him because he was so anointed and gifted and the king liked him so much they say we got to get rid of this guy so they say the only way he's so smooth the only way we can get to him is through his faith through his religious practices and so they made the king sign an edict that, that what nobody could pray to anybody but the king for 30 days for 30 days Daniel says, I'm as obedient as I am to the king. I'm not going to follow that. I'm going to keep my prayer life consistent with my faith in God. And they caught him praying and he ended up being thrown in the lion's den. But the king, King Darius, knew the power of Daniel's God. The king couldn't even sleep for praying for Daniel in the lion's den. He woke up the next day, ran to the den, and Daniel was still alive. He brought him out promoted him and through the men and their wives and their children in the den and they became food for the lions God said you're in good company and don't forget about my only begotten son who suffered the most humiliating public humiliating suffering in the history of the world but after he died and rose again I have elevated him to the name that is above every name there is blessings and sufferings and so you would think well since God has been preparing you all your life brother Cochran how did it all start it started in 1960 in Shreveport Louisiana when I was born at Confederate Memorial Hospital in Shreveport Louisiana it was the hospital where the families that did not have health care insurance went to have all their needs met at the time I was born, I already had three big brothers, and when my mom and dad took me home from the hospital, they took me to the projects where we were living in Allendale and Alameda Terrace projects. A couple of years later, two girls were added to my family. Four boys and two girls. Dad left my mother for another woman and left us all by ourselves in the projects. While dad was living with us, we were poor. When dad left, we went down a level, we became PO, P-O. We could not afford the other O and the R, so we dropped down a level. And we couldn't afford the rent in the projects anymore, so mom moved us a couple of blocks over in an alley called Rear Snow Street. Snow Street was a street in Allendale lined with shotgun houses on both sides of the street the high quality shotgun houses. And I was thinking, is there such a thing as a high quality shotgun house? Then in the alley where the, the, the landlords of the shotgun houses in the alley were not as good as the landlords on the main street. So the shotgun houses in the alley were stank shotgun houses. And we had to live in one of those. I remember at five years old, thinking how terrible it was to be poor. My family, brothers and sisters, were on the welfare program, we received a check every month. We were on the free, uh, the free lunch program at school and we received food stamps every month for my single mom, single faith-filled praying mother, took care of her six children using government assistance. And I can remember sometimes mom would tell us to keep every jug and pot in the house full of water a few days later, we'd come home from school, turn on the water faucets, no water would come out. Mom knew she didn't have enough money to pay that water bill. 
So we would have to use water for that water in those jugs and pots for our baths and for cooking and for flushing the toilet. Seems like for weeks at a time in some instances. There were times when the gas would be turned off and all we had was a little electric plate, little one hour electric plate. We used to plug it in and mom would cook our meals on that electric plate. Seems like forever as a little kid before the, the, the gas was turned back on and we could use the stove. Six kids, when we received, when we came home from school, we had a rule that we had to call Mimi, my grandmother, to let her know that everybody was at home. And sometimes we came home and picked up the phone. There was no dial tone because mama didn't have enough money to pay the telephone bill. We were poor. On Fridays, the families in the alley, the moms used to give their children a little change to go to the corner store to buy some candy. For the most part, that wasn't, we weren't included in that. We only had that opportunity about once a month at the beginning of the month. And we used to have to sit on our porch and watch the other kids in the alley eat their candy. And we'd be sitting there just begging, give me some. <laughs> I realized that poverty was terrible. But it was also at five years old in that alley that one Sunday after church, we heard the sounds of sirens coming down Snow Street, which was not unusual because Allendale had a lot of emergencies all the time, and there were always fire trucks and police cars going through Allendale. But this day was different. It was a reset moment in my little childhood life because we opened our front door. We were laying on the living room floor watching a little black and white TV with a coat hanger sticking out of the top of it that was wrapped in some foil because the rabbit ears had been broken. And those of you who are under 25 years old, ask your mama to explain to you what a rabbit, what rabbit ears are. <laughs> but they were broken, so uh, we sprang to our feet, opened the front door, and right in front of our house, in our alley, was a big red Shreveport Fire Department fire truck. And I watched those firefighters with such excitement when they put on those long black rubber boots they used to wear, the big coats and helmets, took the hose off, went into Miss Maddie's house, put the fire out. I was Smitten from that day, I told my mama, brothers and sisters, I want to be a fireman when I grow up. So I thought about it all the time, not being poor. want to be a fireman. I used to watch the men brothers at Galilee Baptist Church when they showed up at church in their nice cars. Those that had wives and children, they would get out. They were so nicely dressed. Children were so pretty. I dreamed and saw a picture of what a husband and a father was supposed to be like, because my mom never remarried. So I watched those guys and watched Pastor E. Edward Jones as a kid and had a vision for what a man should be in, the, in my life. My grandmother used to take us to the grocery store. There was a man that picked her up, came by and got me and my little sisters. And he'd drive through the fancy neighborhoods. And we'd play this game. You may have played it. That's my house. Anytime we saw a house that was better than our shotgun house, we said, that's my house. We'd go a few blocks later and see another one, and we'd change our mind. That's my house. In our neighborhood, there was a big dirt hill that we used to sit on to watch cars go by. We used to go and play on that dirt hill. Uh, and check this out. In the hill, there was uh, clay dirt. And if you dig deep enough, there was chunks of meaty clay that we used to eat like candy. And we'd watch cars go by, and we'd say, that's my car, and that's my car. God had a vision in my house, and one in my heart that one day I would own a car because we walked everywhere we went. And so I realized that. And ch children used to be asked all the time by the grown-ups, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I always knew what I wanted. I wanted to be a firefighter, and I did not want to be poor. I wanted to be a husband. I wanted a pretty wife, and I wanted children. And I always told them what I wanted. God put that in my heart. When I became a seventh grader, our seventh grade teacher, Ms. Mabel Cutler, asked her seventh graders to research two careers of what you want to be when you grow up. I researched firefighter and architect and found out that architects made more money than firefighters. So when I reached the ninth grade at Woodlawn High School, my ninth grade counselor, Velma Hudson, asked me, what are you going to college for? I said, I'm going to college to be an architect. She said, these are the classes you need to take. And she laid out the ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade curriculum for me to be a successful architectural student. I took all of her advice, except for her advice on the math classes. 
So when I reached Louisiana Tech University in Ruston, Louisiana, after one year and one quarter, I found myself on academic probation. And me and a buddy of mine who was also kicked out on academic probation, he had an old car. We loaded all of our stuff up in his car and we were heading from Ruston to Shreveport. He was excited because his daddy had hookups and he already had a good job set up. And I was facing going home and telling my mom that I would not be going back to Louisiana Tech because I was out on academic probation as hard as she worked to get me there. And I was the first person in my family to go to college. Everybody was so excited about Kelvin being in college. And I had to face her and tell her that I couldn't go back. When I told her it broke her heart, and she said, you can't just sit around here. You're going to have to find a job. And so I went back to my old job at El Chico's Mexican restaurant and put in an application with the Shreveport Fire Department. And one day, brothers and sisters, while in that kitchen covered with hot sauce and chili, I received a phone call from a recruiter from the Shreveport Fire Department. And in 1981, I became a Shreveport firefighter. God made my dream come true. While I was going through the Recruit Academy, I watched the training officers. They were such awesome role models, always sharp in their uniforms. And I dreamed before, when I get settled, I want to become a training officer. Four years later, there was a cold storage explosion that killed a training officer and badly injured another one, created two vacancies, and I applied for the promotion and got promoted to captain and training officer. Five years after that, while I continued to apply the rules that the adults said would make my dream come true, believe in God, go to school and get a good education, respect grown people and treat other children like you want to be treated. I continue to apply those principles even in my professional capacity and it gave me another promotion to the assistant chief of the training academy. When I continue to apply those principles, nine years later I became the fire chief of the city of Shreveport Fire Department, even after everyone in the community told me, Kelvin, you're a good man and you've prepared yourself for this opportunity, but don't get your hopes up. But because of the race relations and political climate, they said Shreveport is not ready for an African-American fire chief, so don't get your hopes up. But they didn't know in whom I had my hope in. My hope was not in Mayor Keith Hightower. My hope was not in the influential black leaders who thought they had enough influence to pull that string. My hope was in the Most High God. So after eight and a half, nine years of serving in that capacity, Mayor Shirley Franklin called me up and appointed me to be her fire chief the second term of her administration. In the third year, two, le two years left, we went through 20 months of budget cuts due to the economic downturn. But after those 20 months, there was another reset in my life when President Barack Obama appointed me to the United to head the United States Fire Administration, the highest position of leadership in the fire service in the United States of America. That scripture is true. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. After I was there for 10 months, Mayor Kasim Reed came to Washington, D.C. and recruited me back to Atlanta, made me an offer I could not refuse, and I have faithfully served under his leadership until January the 6th of 2015. That is my career testimony. My family testimony started in 1981 when I became a firefighter. When I became a firefighter, one of the first African Americans in Shreveport, I became a very popular guy. The whole city was proud. Everybody was proud. And the ladies were proud too, fellas. They were very proud. And I used to ride through the neighborhoods on the back of that truck, man, just bobbing and weaving. And they just used to f follow me back to the fire station. Give me a phone call. Get, here's my number. Give me a, I, listen, it was, it's something about a guy wearing a uniform. And I love wearing that uniform and I wore it well. I, I think I even wore my uniform to the club because it gave me an edge <laughs> on the brothers. And you know, Houdini was very popular in those days. And uh, 
You remember that hit song that had one love, one love, you're lucky just to have this one? I liked the dance off of it, but I wasn't interested in that one. The one I was more interested in was the freaks come out at night. <laughs> <laughs> and so I dated like crazy for about four months and God woke me up one morning and said this is not the life that I called you to live <laughs> and you need to find yourself a wife listen God has said that to some single brothers in here today this is not the life that I called you to live and you need to find yourself a wife and so my plan was, rather than try to go to the clubs to find one, God said, I want you to think back of all the girlfriends you've had in your life, which in my case was not very many, because coming through school I was skinny, I couldn't get my afro together, I wore the hand-me-down clothes of my big brothers, and my Chuck Taylors were stank and worn out most of the time. And so I couldn't get the cheerleaders and the pep squad girls and the, the majorettes. And uh, I guess through going through school, all I had to do was pick from, uh, and I hate to use this word, the leftovers. So I thought about my girlfriend in college, quickly ruled her out. Thought about the two, maybe three I had in high school, ruled them out. Thought about the two I had in middle school, one of them I kind of was stuck on for a minute pondering and then God said, that's not the one. Went all the way back to the fourth grade and Carolyn Marshall moved my heart. And so God, I said, I gotta find Carolyn Marshall. So I picked up the Shreveport Bossier City phone book, started with the A Marshall. Called the A Marshall and said, my name is Kelvin Cochran. I'm looking for a girl I used to go with in the fourth grade. <laughs> her name is Carolyn Marshall, do you know her? They said, no, I hung up and went to the B Marshalls and to the C Marshalls, all the way to the Z Marshalls. Nobody admitted that they knew Carolyn Marshall. I was miserable, this was another reset moment. So I went to all the neighborhoods where I knew she used to live, hoping that I would see her walking down the street or sitting on the front porch or know somebody that I knew back then that knew her and maybe get to ask them, came up empty. I was miserable. I was suffering. So God said, go back to the phone book. And my response, God, I've already gone to the phone book. He said, go back to the phone book. Went back to the phone book and look, and lo and behold, I missed one of all those marshals. And it was C.F. Marshall. Now, her name is Carolyn Faye Marshall. They had it under disguise. So, so I said, let me call old C.F. So I called C.F. and I started with my little script. My name is Kelvin Cochran. I'm trying to find a girl I used to go with in the fourth grade. And the voice said, this is she. And I said, Carolyn, you remember me? I'm Kelvin Cochran. Yeah, I remember you. I gave her my spiel. I said, Carolyn, I'm a firefighter now. I have a good job, good benefits. I've been dating like crazy for the last four months. God woke me up one morning, told me to find a wife, and you are the chosen one. <laughs> of course, she told me I was crazy, and I went on to explain to her the, the vision in my heart. And she says, I have a boyfriend. I said, I'm hearing that. Can I come over and talk to you about it? She said, no. He's on the way over here right now. And I was miserable and she said, but he'll be at work tomorrow night. And so, <laughs> so I said, well, can I come over tomorrow night? And she allowed me to come over the next night. She was still living with her mother over in some projects in Allendale and I walked in. She sat me down at the table and went and made me a cup of hot chocolate. I thought this is some hospitality. When she came back with the chocolate, I knelt down on one knee, didn't even have a ring, brother, and you don't have to have it all together when you make that first move. And even have the ring, and I proposed to her. She jumped up, ran to the back, and brought out her mother. She said, Mom, you're not going to believe this. I hadn't seen this guy in years, and he's come over here to ask me to marry him. And I told her mother I wanted to marry her daughter. She thought I was crazy. Well, six months later, we got married, and this next coming June, we will have been married for 33 years. And that's old C.F. Marshall sitting right there on the front row. 
And we have three beautiful children. Tiffany is 30, Kelton is 28, and my baby Camille is 26, sitting right next to OCF Marshall right there. So God's blessed us with a beautiful family. And so we, we have evolved in our life. Our marriage uh, has not always been as wonderful as it is today. We started off struggling, y'all. You can imagine not going straight from, uh, from a phone call to uh, an engagement ring. You know, you just, there's a lot of learning that you have to do about one another. But we went through those tumultual years. God brought us through all of that. And most of it was me. Most of it was me. And I remember times when we were barely making it from paycheck to paycheck. We would get paid two days after we'd get paid. We'd have to wait two more weeks for another check. Difficult days. When Camille was born, we were living in an apartment. They only would allow you to have two children in the apartment. We were barely making it already. So we were just coming home worried every day that there was going to be a notice on our door saying, we know you got another child, you got to get up out of here. So we began to pray about it, and God brought us to this nice little house that was practically brand new. An older couple had bought it and then found out that the husband had cancer, so they put it on the market so they can travel to live out the rest of his day. So it was practically new when we got it, and it was uh, just within our budget. But when we moved in that house, God put it on my heart that I need to begin to tithe. And I said, well, God, I'm barely making it now. <laughs> I'm going to give you 10% of what I got. And then he said, okay, not just the net, the growth, gross. And so I was obedient to God. And when I told Carolyn, she was so mad at me. But I always say she ain't mad today because God did exactly what he said he was going to do. He opened up the windows of heaven and poured out blessings that we have not had room enough to receive. My children don't know what it's like to have to eat a mayonnaise sandwich and drink sugar water. And they don't have to know, know what it's like to all the children sleeping in the same bed. They don't know that experience because God has blessed our family. So the last part of this testimony is what's up with this book that caused you to lose the career that you have poured so much into for the last 34 years. It started when we were going through the first series of the Quest for Authentic Manhood. Peter Gaddis and I were facilitating a class, and when we reached the module on God's purpose for man, and we watched the video, we began to ask the question, are men today still suffer, suffering from the consequences of what Adam did in the garden? So each man had an opportunity to share their experiences with that. And as each man shared their testimony about issues they were having with sex and with fatherhood and with marriage and with jealousy and anger and depression and all the other ills associated with a life in the flesh, as they each shared, the question would keep popping up in my head. Who told you that you were naked? So God put it in my heart to research the word naked. And I researched the words in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I found out, brothers, that God meant more than who told you that you don't have on any clothes. Nakedness is a condition of condemnation and deprivation. Condemnation always says, I can never do enough to have a right relationship with God. I can never do enough to have a right relationship with God. And God is going to punish me sooner or later for the way that I am. Always in condemnation. We go through periods where we think that our salvation is only good between transgressions to where, you know, we, we have a transgression, we pray and ask for forgiveness, we, we experience the peace of God, and then between transgressions we feel saved. But as soon as we have another transgression, we are back, right back into condemnation all over again. Deprivation is that struggle that we have of not enough. Nothing is ever enough. Have a beautiful wife and obedient children, but it's not enough. You got you to gotta have another woman. You have a nice house that's accommodating all your needs, but you have, a, have to have a bigger one. You have a good car that'll get you to A from a, point A to point B, but you got to have a better one. You got a good job with good benefits, but, and this is not always bad, but you got to have another one. But the challenge is sometimes we don't even master the level that we're on for one job before we start reaching for another job 
and a deprived man will quit a good job trying to find a better job and be broke in between. So that's nakedness. Condemnation and deprivation is naked. But I found out when I researched the word clothed that it means salvation, restoration, and redemption. Remember in the garden, Adam thought that his solution for nakedness was fig leaves. So he put some on himself and he put some on his wife. He realized that was not enough. He still felt awful. So they hid behind a tree and it still didn't do good enough. God showed up and asked him, who told you that you were naked? He blamed Eve and he blamed God. And men are still doing the same thing today because we can't release condemnation and deprivation and satisfy the emptiness on the inside. We continue to blame our wife, blame our children, blame our mama, blame our daddy when the responsibility lies within ourselves. And so what God did in the garden was he slay an innocent lamb, shed his blood and clothed them with coats of skin. Fast forward 2,000 years, Galatians 3 and 27 says, those who have been clothed with Christ, have been baptized in Christ, have been clothed with Christ. The clothed mentality, brothers, is free from condemnation, free from guilt, free from shame, free from doubt and fear, and a sense of restoration. Those six things that God placed on Adam in the beginning have been restored to the clothed man. Bless, fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, and dominion. That's the mindset of a clothed man. And a clothed man will bring salvation to his entire household, even his entire family. If there are not other clothed men in your family, your blessing will spread to your brothers and sisters and their children. That's the blessing of a clothed man. So what does that have to do with all this controversy? In the book, you can't talk about men overcoming condemnation and deprivation unless you talk about sex. You can't talk about sex unless you talk about it within the context of scripture and God's purpose for sex, which is procreation. You can't talk about procreation without talking about how God designed it, which is to be between a man and a woman. They are the only two that can make babies. And so God intended for a man and a woman to procreate in the bounds of holy matrimony. And that's what got me in trouble. The truth will set you free. But I would also, I've also found out that the truth will make a lot of people angry. And that there are worldly consequences for standing up for righteousness in these current times. But what my life is unfolding before everybody is that there are also kingdom consequences for standing up in righteousness in these times. And God is about to unfold the kingdom consequences so that everybody will see what happens into the life of a man that stands up and has the courage of his convictions to stand by his Christ. I am not worried about loss. Remember, Peter said, Jesus, we've lost everything to follow you. Jesus said, let me set the record straight. Ain't nobody ever left. You, you haven't lost husband or wife or children or house or lands for my sake that you shall not receive 100 fold in this life with persecution. And after that, eternal life. My family and I are not going to lose our house. We're not going to have to go back to eating mayonnaise sandwiches and drinking sugar water. God is going to supply all of my needs according to his riches. We're not going to lack anything. And so what's my resolve after all of this experience? You know, in the last few years, 17 years ago, I began this practice. I made up my mind that I was going to get up every morning, no matter what's going on in my life, and go in a consecrated, selected place in my house and pray over it, and then go there every morning, first thing in the morning, and lay out flat on my face and worship and pray to God. And I've been doing that for the last 17 years. And I can tell you, brothers and sisters, that there were some times that the night before or the day before, I had done some things that I was embarrassed and shamed. Didn't even feel worthy going in there. 
but I would make my way, press my way into there, and I would lay before the Lord, and I would worship and pray. When we were going through Master Life a few years ago, I was sharing that experience with my class, and God put it on my heart to say, you thought that the days that you went in that room, that you had several days that you thought you wasn't doing anything wrong, that those were the most precious days coming in that room to me. But the most precious days were, were those days where the night before or the day before you had done something that embarrassed you and put you to shame and you made your way in, in there anyway. And that those were the most precious days for me. Over the last five or six or so years, I have a habit. When I walk, work out, I have committed to memory Psalm 27, Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, and Psalm 112. Those scriptures are a blessing to me. And brothers, if you haven't read them lately or read them at all, read Psalm 27, Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, and Psalm 112. So when I get started on the treadmill or the elliptical, after I've recited all those scriptures, I've had a 30-minute workout. And then I cool down and I, I work out and do something else. What I found was in that routine, I got to where I was just saying the words and they weren't really resonating. I wasn't thinking about what I was saying. But this reset suffering has caused me to reflect on every word, on every scripture, and they have breathed life and strength into my body. And I want to share with you Psalms 27 as a reminder that those of you, my brothers and sisters, who are going through a reset real life application in real time, that you'll hear the words of the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, and now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Therefore I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I see. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me. O God of my salvation, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord shall take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Lead me in the plain path. Because of my enemies, deliver me not over to the will of my enemies. For false witnesses have risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I would have fainted, lest I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord. In the land of the living, to those of you who are going through real life application, real time resets, wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Let me tell you something. In your suffering, God has not thrown us under the bus. Our back is not against the wall. We are not at the end of our rope. And throwing in the towel is not an option for a child of God who is going through God-inflicted sufferings. My resolve is I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back.